Hey everyone, welcome to the Taped Podcast, the most ooh-la-la podcast in the world. <laughs> we are your hosts, myself, Mickey T. And me, Nostalgia. And for today's episode of the Taped Podcast, we are going to be doing another recap monthly episode where we recap noteworthy albums that came out. This time we're just recapping stuff that came out in June. And yeah, it's pretty simple and without wasting any more time, let's just get right into it. Mm -hmm. The first album that we're going to be talking about today is a pretty big one. We have (laughs) Run the Jewels by RTJ4. Not RTJ4 by Run the Jewels. (laughs) Yeah, I think we we started both months. Last month as well was a pretty big one in the Carsey headrest. This was no different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, This is, if you don't know already, this is the fourth installment in the Run the Jewels catalog. And, uh, you know, Killer Mike, LP. And in my opinion... Run the Jewels 4 might be the best one. It might be the best Run the Jewels. The I, production. Yeah, I think it is. The, the produ- it might be. <laughs> the, production, the production on this album is pretty much like a culmination of everything that Run the Jewels have done up to this point. You know, like the futuristic sci-fi feel mm. of RTJ3 with the punchy brutality of RTJ2 alongside some really fierce wordplay flows and some really tight political bars killer mike and lp are still amazing together bringing us back-to-back quality verses and some of these verses on this album are just really relevant to the current state of the political climate in the u.s right now that it's pretty insane like yeah. you know that you know the killer mike's verse on walking in the snow yeah walking and, in the you snow. know of course yeah basically making the reference to the i can't breathe line which is just what the hell? Like, he wrote that before the whole Yeah, that was happened. last October. It just yeah. really comes to show that this is not a new issue. It's just on everybody's minds at last, I think. Exactly. People are kind like, of, <laughs> you know, aware. I think everyone is aware at this point. And I, don't, I couldn't think of a more perfect time to release this. I don't... I doubt it was... I think it was just a lucky coincidence with, you know, the release date that it came out when it did, but it it really hits even more so because of what's happening right now. Um, yeah, exactly. Not even also tracks like Just as well, you know. Yeah. Everything here is like, very politically charged and very relevant. Very very relevant. Exactly. I love that line, look at all the <clears throat> slave masters posing mm-hmm. on your dollar. That that's actually really clever as well considering like the connotations of uh, the people that you find on the dollar bill. Plus, basically, mm. there's favoritism going on with the economy over in America. So it's all pretty relevant. And, you know, Killer Mike and LP just deliver these in such a passion, passionate way. And Killer Mike especially. I feel like this has some of mm. uh, his best verses, but obviously you can't discredit LP. LP is still on point. And basically, yeah, yeah this might be the best one. Yeah, also, I will also... Not to mention... I forgot to mention, the features were great as well. They yeah. were impressive with the features. Like, Pharrell, Zach De La Rocha, Josh Homme, even though he was underutilized, and Mavis Staples, they all had great contributions. The only yeah. feature I didn't really care for was 2 Chains. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, everything, I think... I think this is also... The production, I think, is definitely my favorite on any Run The Jewels album. It's It's a lot more abrasive, a lot more raw, a lot more in your face... And that's not saying that it already wasn't, it always was, and I think everything is just a lot more immediate on this album, and it's just, like, LP took the production just, and just turned it up till 11, the fucking flows from both LP and Killer Mike, or I I would argue they're both, like, at their best here, especially Killer Mike, Um, features, as he mentioned, are perfect, they adds so much to like the tracks without you know ever stealing the spotlight um and overall it's just it's filled with some of the best rap songs i've heard in the last few years certainly this year i don't think it has really any competition when it comes to hip-hop this year Um, it really does honestly this could be an album of the year contender for me this is a very early not very early at this point. I, time is flying. I'm getting yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's it's a it's an album of the year contender. It's gonna it's gonna be in the conversation come December for sure. Definitely. 
Okay, um, uh, my my favorite tracks from RTJ4 are Yankee and the Brave, Walking in the Snow, Just, The Ground Below, Pulling the Pin, and a few words for the Firing Squad. My least favorite track was Out of Sight, and I gave this album a decent 9. Uh, my favorite tracks were Yankee and the Brave, Ooh La La, Goonies vs. E.T., Walking in the Snow, Just, a few words from the Firing Squad. Uh, my least favorite track, if I had to pick, was Never Look Back, and I also gave it a decent 9 out of 10. Yes, love to hear it. <laughs> okay, so moving on, we have another hip hop release. We got Shrines mm-hmm. by Arm and Hammer. This is the fifth studio album from the abstract hip hop duo consisting of Billy Woods and Elucid. And I'm not too familiar with Elucid, but I'm familiar with Billy Woods. I remember he came out with a project with Kenny Siegel about mm. last year, I think. And I really like that. But this time around, I feel like I do enjoy Shrines, but it is a bit iffy on some departments. Like, I feel like the album is great in the technical and lyrical department. Production-wise, it's pretty inconsistent. It goes for a more very dark and very abstract vibe. But a lot of them just don't really do it for me, and it's not overly great, I suppose. It flows inconsistently, and, you know, a lot of the features weren't great. I was pretty disappointed by a couple of them. But all in all, I just think it's okay. Not Nothing special. It's just uh, enjoyable for the most part. Um, I've I've always enjoyed the stuff that Elucid and Billy Woods brought on their Arm and Hammer project. Um, I think the duo does have some very good chemistry. But anytime I listen to an, an an Arm and Hammer project, I always, I always want a bit more than I get. I think that it feels, especially now on Shrines, it feels like their formula has hasn't changed that much. I think the songs here are lacking any real excitement or intensity. Um, lyricism has always been a strong point and that's still fantastic and if you want to look into the lyrics there's definitely a lot to read into there there's a a lot to appreciate there Uh, but really there's nothing that blows me away when it comes to the dynamics of the instrumentation or the flows or anything on this album I think it's it's a bit I wouldn't say it's much worse than their previous efforts like Rome and Paraffin but I think it's just not different enough to really stand out. Um, once again, it's it's not bad. I, I did enjoy a lot of it, but I, I definitely left wanting a lot more. And that's a fair observation. Uh, my favorite tracks from this album are Pommel Horse, Leopards, King Tubby, Frida, and Slewfoot. My least favorite track was Solarium, and I gave this album a light 7. Uh, my favorite tracks were Bitter Cassava, Dead Cars, and Ramsey's the Second. My least favorite track was Flavor Flav and The Parables, and I give this uh, album a decent 5 out of 10. Fair enough. Next, we have Goons Be Gone by No Age. This is the fifth studio album from California-based noise pop and indie rock outfit. And um, personally, I think that this album is a bit of a mixed bag. Like, there's blends of uh, indie rock and noise pop, obviously. There's some good songs here and there, but I feel like it's ill-conceived and pretty unmemorable. Like, the more experimental tracks are kind of bland and not at all that interesting. I don't know, they, I could have asked for a bit more from this. And I could have asked for a bit better, I would say. Uh, the vocals, for the most part, are decent enough, and the songwriting didn't, doesn't really hit me as much as I as I hoped it would. And I feel like... I feel like this album kind of relies a bit too much on aesthetics rather than mm. actual, than an actual cohesive unit of an album, and that's a bit disappointing. But that's not uh, the only thing that I can really discredit it for. I I actually have to give credit to a lot of the drum work. I did enjoy plenty of the drum work on this album, and uh, the riffs were pretty decent for the most part. But other than that, I just think it's a pretty standard like blend of noise pop and uh, indie rock. Nothing, nothing special. Nothing bad. Just kind of middle of the road for me. Um, yeah, I agree. I uh, at this point in our careers, I think No Age kind of already have the sound, the aesthetic, as you said, that they're going for ingrained in their mind, and they just, you know, they seem to be kind of playing it safe. I I was quite the fan of their last record. Um, I don't know. This one just doesn't really hit as much. It's it's still very punky, very noisy, very atmospheric and dreamy, and the sound that they like provide on this album is is very similar to what they've been doing previously. But I just didn't 
like come out of this project enjoying it as much i just felt like i would have liked if they maybe experimented with that a bit more gave us some new ideas it just seems to be a, a, a pretty um a pretty safe effort from the group um it is enjoyable it's certainly enjoyable uh, the instrumentation is always very raw and very dreamy at the same time and i do enjoy it but i just wish there was more to it kind of similar uh when it comes to the complaints to the last album in that they both kind of seem like they're not really doing anything new anything groundbreaking and yeah this new age album definitely feels like it's in that same ballpark for me all right uh, my favorite tracks from Goons Be Gone are Smoothie, Feeler, and Puzzled. My least favorite track was Working Stiff Takes a Break, and I gave this album a 6. Uh, my favorite tracks were Sandalwood, Feeler, and Smoothie. My least favorite tracks were Toes in the Water, and I gave it a light 6. Alright. Next, we have Sideways to New Italy by Rolling Blackout's Coastal Fever. This is the sophomore album from Australian jangle pop and indie rock outfit, uh, Rolling Blackouts Coastal Fever, and I actually enjoyed this album a fair bit, a lot more than I initially thought I would, because when I read reviews and see people talking about this, people weren't really as big into this as their debut. I haven't listened to the debut yet, but I'm going to get to it eventually. But with this album, I actually really liked it. Instrumental-wise, it's pretty upbeat. It has a really breezy and very summery vibe. This is definitely something I could like jam out to during the hot days of the summer, and it's actually really nice. I love a lot of the guitar work. It's very pleasant to the ear. I like a lot of the punchy drums. They sound pretty great most of the time. And Fran Keeney's vocals are good throughout, but most of the songwriting isn't all that crazy. That's all the complaints that I have, but all in all, I just think it's a pretty solid, fun record. Um, This album is a bit confusing to me because for whatever reason, I could never really get into um, their 2018 album, Hope Downs. And even though on this new project, the band doesn't really sound all too dissimilar from what they were going on that previous release. I don't know, this album just, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I can't really explain why, the sound is pretty similar to the first album. I just feel like it's a bit more subtle, a bit more pleasant and cohesive from start to finish. I think maybe now that I'm sold over on the band, I, I may return to that 2018 album and definitely get a lot more enjoyment out of it than I, than I did last time um but yeah this this album really cl clicked with me it's very breezy very fun very light it's just easy listening you know indie jangle pop jangle rock and it's definitely enjoyable i would definitely recommend this i would too uh my favorite tracks from this album are cars in space the second of the first and the only one uh, my least favorite track is Sunglasses at the Wedding, and I gave this a strong 7. We're kind of similar there. My favorite tracks were Second to the First, Falling Thunder, and Cars in Space, and my least favorite track was Sunglasses at the Wedding, and I gave it a light 7. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I love, I love to see the, I love to see the yes. agreement. Hell yeah. <laughs> Alright, moving on, we got Ungodly Hour by Chloe X. Halley. Uh, this is the sophomore album from the Atlanta contemporary R&B duo Sisters, Chloe and Halle Bailey. And this time around, they bring us a very enjoyable project with nice, fresh takes on contemporary R&B. They infuse elements of trap into the production while also taking influence from the likes of Beyonce and Drake. And with their contemporaries this year that tried to do the same thing as they did, I feel like they made the production a lot more interesting, whereas the others kind of failed to do so. Uh, the production, again, it slaps from front to back. The vocals from the girls are great. A lot of the shallow, a lot of the songwriting is a bit shallow for my liking, but there are definitely some great moments for songwriting, like Wonder What She Thinks of Me. And all in all, I really enjoy this. It's probably, this is a nice, fresh take on contemporary R&B, and I'm really liking it. Yeah, when it, when it, when it comes to R&B, I don't think I've heard an album I've enjoyed more this year. I think um, what Chloe and Holly have brought to the table here are, is genuinely, I don't think it's fantastic, I, I think it does have its problems, but I think it is a, it's a sign of good things to come at least. Um, the album I think does have some lackluster and less memorable part, like parts, especially when it comes to the production for me. 
um, sometimes the songwriting, but for the most part, the production is pretty good. Um, the songs are all mostly well written, definitely well performed, and as a whole, I think it's it comes together to be a cohesive and enjoyable project, and one that is, as I said, more of a sign of great things to come rather than, you know, a defining moment. But that being said, it's it's definitely a good album, and I would definitely recommend it to anyone who is a fan of their R&B, you know, who loves some R&B, you'll love this. I agree. I agree. You, you, if you like this, if you like R&B, you'll like this anyway. Yeah, so, I don't think there's anything better in the genre this year, to be honest. That That is true. We've just gotten so many slogs of contemporary <laughs> R&B this year. It's oh, just that not Kalani really one, funny. And then the uh, Tiana uh, Taylor we'll, we'll be talking about. We'll get to Tiana Taylor later <laughs> on. Well, as of right now, uh, my favorite tracks from uh, Ungodly Hour are Wonder What She Thinks of Me, Don't Make It Hard On Me, and Ungodly Hour. My least favorite track is Royal, and I gave this album a strong 7. My favorite tracks were Forgive Me, Lonely, and definitely the title track. I'm absolutely loving that one. And my least favorite tracks were Tipsy and Catch Up, and I gave this album a strong 6 out of 10. Alright, next we have (laughs) another pretty big one. We have uh, Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers. This is the sophomore album from the California singer-songwriter, and as far as singer-songwriter records go this year, I think Phoebe Bridgers might have one of my favorite ones. It's kind of tied between uh, between Fiona Apple and, and uh, this one for me. As a songwriter, Phoebe portrays a very vulnerable individual, bringing up you know personal relationships, personal well-being, in a much more raw and a pretty emotive and very poignant way. Like, a lot of these lyrics are really, really great. Like, especially the opening lines on... Um, what was it? Uh, Graceland 2. That gives me chills down my spine every time I listen to it. Because holy shit, it's just the way that it's worded and the way that it's said is uh, just so powerful. And that's an admirable quality that Phoebe Bridgers has as a songwriter. Her lyrics can be very powerful and very poignant, and I love that aspect of her music. Production-wise, this album is really good. It's it's hollow, yet it's serene and pretty beautiful, comprising of a lot of atmosphere, a lot of washed-out guitars, and a lot of orchestral strings, and they work to her advantage, and they just add to the uh, to the sereneness of her songwriting, vocals, and, of course, the production. And all in all, that's all I really have to say. It's just a fantastic record from uh, Miss Bridgers. Um, I, I think her 2017 album, Stranger of the Alps, you know, that... That album is definitely one of my favorite albums of of the last decade, and when you know when this album gets brought up, I was, I think it's not quite as good, but I'm more than delighted with you know the weight, the three year weight that came with this release. I think it lives up to expectations. I think it's amazing. I think I, I'm I'm kind of being a bit uh, hesitant to say it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, that's what I was getting at. Um, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's as good as Stranger in the Alps. I think that is still the defining album in her career for now. But if anything, it's just a testament to how good that album is rather than me taking anything away from this because this is brilliant. I think her vocals are amazing on this. I think the emotion and the, um, intimacy really shines through the production and just completely perfectly matches this kind of sincere and uh, intimate aesthetic of the album. Uh, the instrumentation as a whole, I think, is a lot more busy, a lot more, um, you know, a lot more layered than what it was on uh, Stranger of the Alps, which was quite simple. Simple yet poignant. Uh, this one remains just as poignant, but with a lot more, you know, different sounds, different ideas. And overall, I think this is pretty much exactly what I would have wanted from a follow-up album. Um, you know, her sound that she's proven herself with, but with a lot more uh, new ideas and refinements. And I think the only, maybe the main reason I prefer Stranger in the Alps is because of, you know, the history I have listening to that album religiously for the last three years. Um Maybe three years from now, I'll be looking at this one as her uh, best album. But 
that being said, I think it's another album of the year contender. It blew me away. And I just, I, words can't explain how delighted I am with this after the three year wait. That's great. Happy for you. <laughs> and I Thanks, actually man. do need to check out her, her debut. For sure, for sure. All right, my favorite tracks from Punisher are Graceland 2, Savior Complex, and uh, Moonsong. My least favorite track was probably Halloween, and I gave this album a strong 8. Uh, my favorite tracks were Garden Song, Kyoto, Punisher, Chinese Satellite, ICU, Graceland uh, 2, and I Know the End. And my least favorite track was probably Halloween as well, and I gave this a light 9. Nice. I think this is the first month with two nines. Hey. Next, we have The Avalanche by Owen. This is the 10th studio album from Michael Kinsella under the Owen moniker. And instrumentally and vocally and lyrically, this album is very good. But I think what holds me back from enjoying it as much as uh, some other people do is that it's a bit too sleepy for me. You know, I could ask for a bit more uh, life at some degree. Uh, vocally, there could have been a bit more variation. Instrumentally, I felt it was fine, but I'd say there were plenty of songwriting moments that um that flew over my head. But there were moments of good songwriting, but I feel like I'd have to go back and listen to it again to fully grasp um the rest of what is going on in that record, and then maybe I can appreciate it more, or maybe check out more of uh more of uh, Michael Kinsella's stuff. But for now, I'm I like this album, but I could probably just use a bit more time with it. Um. Yeah, I really don't have that much to say about it, even though I very much enjoyed it. Uh, it just feels like more of what you'd expect from Mike Kinsella, without any really new ideas. But the the formula that he's um, you know brought together with his Owen projects is one that is proven to be enjoyable and very relaxing, very intimate, and it just works. And this isn't you know the best, most cutting-edge album he's ever released. This isn't, you know, American Football LP1. But if you're a fan of, you know, Mike Kinsella's previous works on Owen and American Football, then there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't enjoy this and you shouldn't dig it like I have. Um, but if you aren't already sold on, you know, some of his previous projects, then this, this isn't going to sell you. This is pretty much just another... Uh, album of the same ideas but you know with new songs it's it's far from the best album this year mostly because of that it it does kind of take away from you know me holding it in much higher esteem but it is enjoyable and i guess that's what hap that's what matters at the end of the day so i'm, I'm happy with this release all right um my favorite tracks from the avalanche are dead for days I Should Have Known, and I Go Ego. My least favorite track was Headphoned, and I gave this album a light 7. Uh, my favorite track was A New Muse, Dead for Days, On With The Show. I honestly couldn't really point out a least favorite track. Like th There was a lot of tracks that weren't the best, but nothing really stood out as like my least favorite. Uh, and I gave the overall project a light 7. All right. Oh shit! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, translation oh, no. by the Black Eyed Peas. Oh Jesus! <laughs> oh God! Why are Why are the Black Eyed Peas still releasing music? How do they manage to still sell out? <laughs> How do people actually unironically like them? Like I go through some of the genius annotations. So people are actually liking this shit. Like what the fuck? Like this, okay. I don't know. Uh, it, it appeals. <laughs> Like, Black Eyed Peas at this stage, it appeals to the lowest common denominator. Mm. Well, yeah, this is the uh, latest, the eighth studio album from the Black Eyed Peas. Jesus. And this time around, they dabble in some Latin pop and reggae tone. And, you know, it's the popular trend. I'm not surprised they're grabbing onto yeah, who is kind surprised? Of and what else is not surprising is that this album is bad. <laughs> oh, the production is just so generic, but for the most part, it just sounds fine. It's nothing horrendous or anything like that, but it's just lifeless, bland reggaeton and Latin pop. Um, you know, what are some of these sample choices that I've noticed? Like, what? Yeah. They 
basically on rip mode it's just rhythm of the night and that was for the uh for the bad boys 3 uh soundtrack i think for some I can't reason believe they will have... i am would ever just steal a sample and <laughs> it's not like no 10 years ago no. we just took the entirety of <laughs> around the world by daft punk and added some shit vocals to it and tried to hand that over as a sample did you not know that yeah he no, just took no all idea. of he was like oh i'm gonna really release a daft punk remix with my own like twist on it and it's just the instrumental to around the world with him just fucking saying gibberish over it and the, the, the and i love how the instrumental starts with like you know the bass line to the, the beginning of around the world and it's just him going yeah. like this is a remix of daft punk just to make sure like Oh, it's it's not plagiarized, <laughs> and then Daft Punk were just not having it. They were not having it. They were like, "This is you just stole the song. <laughs> we don't want to be associated fun, with this." And fun he fact, took they it sampled off the Daft album. Punk again on this album. I will. I don't think he's gonna they, ever fucking sample them to that extent. Well, technically, he didn't sample their sound. He just sampled their like harder, better, faster, stronger thing, flow hmm. yoke, and um. Yeah, uh, there's plenty of awful vocals, plenty of awful one-liners, very cringy ones. Sometimes they had a good flow, but Jesus Christ, this isn't good. Like, who expected this to be good? And, you know, there's plenty of, like, features that are massive, and most of them just don't land at all. Like Shakira, Tyga, why French Montana? Fr- French Montana <laughs> is an auto- automatic L. And uh, L Alpha, he was just fucking annoying on his track. And yeah, that's all I have to say. This uh, this album is a literal piece of shit. Gen- genuinely, fuck this album. Yeah, it's just imagine Black Eyed Peas doing reggaeton in 2020. I don't think there's a lot more you can really dissect here. It's just a fucking money grab. Uh, yeah. I basically <laughs> said everything. I basically said everything that needed to be said. Um, you give your your best and worst tracks if you have any. I'll, I have to lock the door because the wind is shaking it. Fair, fair. Uh, the, probably the best tracks on this album are Tonto Love, Todo Bueno, and News Today. The, the worst is just the rest of the album, but if I had to pick terrible ones, it would have to be No Manana and Get Loose Now. This shit was awful. It's a light three. Um, my favorite tracks That's were... That's me being generous. I, I, there's only one track that I didn't really, like, mind, and that was the last track, New Today. Uh, my least favorite tracks were literally everything else, honestly. Uh, I gave this a, a very light two. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. I was the more, uh, I was the more lenient one here. <laughs> I was, I was the more liberal one here. For sure. Um, the the sooner right, we next. move on from Black Eyed Peas, the happier I'll be. Same here, same here. <laughs> Alright, uh, next we have The Album by Tiana Taylor. This is the third studio album from singer, actress, model, and choreographer, Tiana Taylor. And this time around, she has uh, full creative control over her project because her last release in 2018 was part of that whole, like, good good music uh, seven-track album summer. Mm. And basically, Kanye had full control over her last album, and she was fucking pissed off about that. So now she has full control over it. And she decides to make it 87 minutes long and 23 (laughs) tracks. And it just doesn't work at all. It is just beyond mind-numbing and extremely bloated. It's very one-dimensional. You know, it's the usual trend of, like, contemporary R&B blending with trap. And it just gets very tiresome after the third track. Like... Ah, uh, it was mind-numbing to just listen through the whole thing and not, like, pass out. Vocally, Tiana is good, but here and there, there's just a lot of songwriting that just isn't all that great by a couple of tracks. It gets very shallow, and I just don't care for a lot of it. It's just filler to the tits. It's by the numbers, <laughs> and yeah, I'm just not a fan of this album. M- maybe next time, but... If you cut this down by, like, fucking ten tracks, then maybe I would have given it a higher score, but for now, I'm just not into this. Um, yeah, with with 23 tracks, and as you said, an hour of se- and 17 minutes of music, you'd hope that she would at least bring, you know, a wide range of diversity and ideas to the table to make the commitment that is sitting down and listening to this album from start to finish, especially more than once, uh, you know, worth the effort. 
but that's just not the case at all. Instead, it's just every track, it just bleeds into the next with its just squeaky clean and lifeless performances and production. You know, the tracks don't really stand out from one another aside from the the features which either make or break these songs. And this heavily this heavy reliance on all the features really takes the focus off Teyana in a way. And it doesn't let her, her personality or just her identity really stand out when, you know, the tracks are mostly, m- like, for me, memorable because of the, the features. Um, you know, on her previous release, uh, KTSC, uh, I think that was a, a pretty good album. I think that um, Kanye was able to provide a nice backdrop for her to be able to shine vocally. I think his production was throughout quite engaging. Um, on this, the production is just lifeless. It's just so squeaky clean, so by the numbers that it's hard to, it's really hard. I can't think like of a memorable track when it comes to the production. All the tracks that I do like off this album are ma- mainly because of the performances. I cannot like remember a single melody, a single track when it comes to the production it's just all lifeless just squeaky clean just blends into the next and this is a a chore to listen to for like an hour and 20 minutes that's it's just too long (laughs) that's all i have to say Uh, (laughs) i'd say the best tracks on this album are back to me let's build and uh, lose each other uh, I don't like the rest of the album. I just forget everything after that. And I gave this <laughs> album a light four. My favorite tracks were Morning, Come Back to Me, Still, and We Got Love. My least favorite tracks were Wrong Bitch, 69, Shoot It Up. And I gave it a light four as well. Alright. Next we have <coughs> Florida Jit by Smoke Perp. This is the sophomore album from the Florida rapper, well known for... His uh, his uh, collaborations with Lil Pump and uh, his old mixtapes like Dead Star, and uh, his last few projects. I've been following Smoke Perp since he blew up, and um, his last few projects were just him copying other artists. Like on Dead Star Two and Bless Your Trap, he was just being a watered down Travis Scott, a watered down Playboy Carti, a watered down Nav. Why would you want to copy Nav? <laughs> and uh, and basically, Florida Jit sees him. Not really copy as many people. He tries to go back to his early, like, SoundCloud type sound with mixed results. You know, all of this was produced by Ronnie J, who I think is a pretty great producer and pretty much carried most of the projects. He had some fantastic beats on here, but some of them were just a bit questionable, to say the least. Perp had some hard verses, but for the most part, he was just extremely lackluster. He hasn't really got much interesting to say. He's just not that great of an artist in general, and, you know, he's just kind of there. He's uh, just another SoundCloud rapper at this stage. Features were fine for the most part. I liked Rick Ross, Lil Pump, and Young Nudie, but I was actually disappointed by Jack Harlow and surprisingly Denzel Curry. And, uh, yeah, overall this album, it's... No, actually, another point. The songs are just too short and somehow just bloated. Like, 17 songs of short... No, 17 tracks of short track lengths. It just comes off as stream bait. And I'm not surprised if he's trying to do that because not, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but Smoke Perp hasn't been relevant in about three years. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, yeah, Smoke Perp, even at his, his best, is far from the most ambitious or cutting, cutting-edge figure in, you know, trap rap. Um, his music has always been quite by the numbers and as you said took very heavily from contemporary artists and that all that kind of led him to become a name that's easily forgotten for me um florida jet hardly features you know a new approach and sound from the rapper yet it's still just just about gritty um entertaining and well produced enough definitely well produced enough uh for it to be at least a, a quite entertaining project from start to finish as he said, um, he doesn't really have much to say on any of these tracks, I think. Um, his flows, however, are quite decent. I think they're engaging a lot of the time. And the production is really quite 
you know, quite impressive on pretty much every track. Even even the tracks I don't really care that much for, I will say are pretty well produced and pretty well put together in that aspect. And overall, I think this may be my favorite Smoke Park project. I, I enjoyed this. Alright, it's not my favorite Smoke Park project, but it's probably like my second favorite. Um, Dead Star? Yeah, Dead Star. Uh, my, fav- my favorite tracks off of Florida Jet are Off My Chest, Hanging Out The Roof, and Big Dog. My least favorite track is Outside, and I gave this album a light 5. Uh, my favorite tracks were Off My Chest, I'm Him, One Play. My least favorite tracks were... My least favorite track was Chopsticks. And I gave this a strong five. Okay. Next, we have another pretty uh, big one. Well, to some mm. degree. Uh, we have The Rough and Rowdy Days by Bob Dylan. Uh, is this like his 37th album? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, well, just know it's the latest album in, in Bob Dylan's long, long career. <laughs> and... Um, I didn't think this was going to be really that good. I've been listening to uh, some Bob Dylan's old uh, albums, and I'm really enjoying that. But thinking that this is the latter half of his career, and with a lot of artists, like they fail to really maintain some form of quality in the latter stages of their career. But I feel like uh, Bob Dylan pulled it off very well, honestly. I think this is a pretty good project. It's surprisingly good to me. Instrumentally, this album you know, mixes uh, elements of folk and blues, there's even a piano ballad at one point. Songwriting-wise, uh, it's still really good. Bob Dylan as a songwriter has always been great. And uh, a lot of it is reminiscing. And there's even uh, that one song about uh, JFK. And um, there was also another song that was like kind of a uh, like take on building your own Frankenstein's monster, if I'm, uh, t- if I'm correct on that. <laughs> and um, mm. I, I like these moments of songwriting. They're pretty cool. There are a couple of minor annoyances, like Bob's rough and aged vocals don't really uh, do it for me a lot of the time. Some of the tracks can be a slight bit too long, and the long pauses at the end of the tracks is pretty annoying a lot of the time. It's not overly consistent, but overall it's a good uh, it's a good project from uh, from the legend himself, Bob Dylan. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think that, you know, to say that uh, Bob Dylan is is past his prime is a bit of an understatement. Um, you know his first album was six whole decades ago almost, and you know taking that into consideration, Rough and Rowdy Ways is is a very a very good album for you know someone so late into their career. Uh, it's it's a very entertaining and likable set of you know poetic folk pieces that you know could pretty much only come from an artist as traveled and experienced as Bob Dylan and you know at this point in his career and you know I'll gladly take what he's given us here on uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways. It's not close to some of his classics that goes without saying but I, I don't think it's ever gonna live up to you know the likes of Highway 61 Revisited or Blonde on Blonde but you know I'm, I'm glad to have another entertaining passionate project from you know a legend like Bob Dylan. He, I'm glad he's still enjoying making music and still putting stuff out there, and I, I can't imagine anything much better coming out, you know, from the man at, at the age he is, and with however many 37 albums, you know, you're bound to not really have that many ideas at that point, but he, he still kept it quite fresh. Yeah. My favorite mm. tracks from Rough and Rowdy Days are Mur- Murder Most Foul, False Prophets, and My Own Version of You. Uh, My least favorite track was probably Crossing the Rubicon, and uh, I gave this album a decent 7. My favorite tracks were I I Contain Multitudes, My Own Version of You, Key West, and Murder Most Foul. My least favorite was False Prophet, and I gave it a decent 7. Lovely, lovely. (laughs) Alright, we have another album. We have... uh, Blast to the Past, or Time Traveling. uh, No... (laughs) <laughs> We're traveling back to the 60s and the 70s, boys. Oh. Um, next album we have is Homegrown by Neil Young. Uh, this is the 17th studio album from singer-songwriter Neil Young. And personally, I don't really care for this project all that much, but there is some nice qualities to it. 
There are some good songs, but there are definitely plenty of subpar songs and some subpar material. Almost feels like B-sides in a way. Instrumental wise, this album sounds very good, but only a few tracks stood out to me and Neil's vocals were fine for the most part, nothing mind blowing or anything like that. The songwriting was uh, decent for the most part, there were some nice moments there, but all in all it wasn't really as consistent for songwriting, and yeah, I don't really have much else to say about this album, I just think it's decent, and yeah. Yeah, the album I think was meant to be released, it, it was set to be released in uh, 1975 for for a multitude of reasons that never came to be and we're only hearing it now 45 years later. Um, you know, and I think it's good. I just think it hardly lives up to, especially the records that he was releasing back in like the seventies. Uh, this was apparently supposed to be a like follow up to On the Beach, yet it shares very little qualities with that album, and it has like no real similarities thematically or when it comes to its direction. And I think that may be why. Well, at least one of the reasons it, it, it's only getting released 45 years later. Um, it just feels way too rough around the edges and too lo- loosely constructed and um, just messy, especially for, you know, what was probably the most successful era in uh, Neil Young's career. Yet, yeah, but for, you know, diehard fans, this is, I would say, this is a must hear, you know, getting to hear. An album that was released in Neil Young's prime, well recorded in Neil Young's prime, um, and yeah, I, I, it's it's nice for what it is. It's nice to hear, um, but it's quite disappointing, you know, considering the albums that came uh, out at that time and actually did get released. Yeah, uh, hmm. my favorite tracks from Homegrown are Little Wing, the title track, and Try. My least favorite was Kansas. And I gave this album a decent six. Uh, my favorite tracks were Separate Ways, White Line, Love is a Rose, and Homegrown. And my least favorite tracks were Florida and We Don't Smoke It No More. And I gave it a decent six. Next, we have Tearless by Amnesia Scanner. This is the third studio album from the Finnish duo Amnesia Scanner. But holy shit, I fucking hate this album. <laughs> I genuinely don't like this album at all. Look, there's some admirable qualities that I can give it. Like, the album is somewhat cohesive with the transitional thing, and it has a cohesive sound. And, you know, it's got some nice production moments, but to me, this album is like if they took whatever was in the 100 Gex leftovers, made it boring, combined it with the worst qualities about Blade, and make it into nine tracks. Um. <laughs> Uh, I'm just I'm just not liking this at all. And also, how the fuck did they get Code Orange on this? Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I I, I, that, I only seen the feature was me. there after I heard the track, and I was like, hold up, wait, what? Where? <laughs> it's just a guitar solo, I think. Like, yeah, like that I barely. Well, like, I don't know. Like, I'm baffled. I, <laughs> like, honestly, I don't know what to make of this. Like, this is probably one of the worst listens I've had all year. And yeah, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. This fuck this album. Um, you know, I will say I think that um, Amnesia Scanner had a plan and a vision in mind when they were crafting Tearless. Yet I just can't help but think that it just fell flat on its face in execution. There are a lot of moments that are clearly meant to feel very atmospheric and unsettling, uh, and they end up feeling just more dull and awkward than anything uh, and the moments that are meant to be like very intense and cathartic just seem rough and poorly executed and the final project is just if I feel like it just doesn't port- portray the sounds that Amnesia's kind of wanted to portray in any way shape or form it just feels like a, a bit of a mess there are some tracks that I do genuinely enjoy but a lot of this album is just very odd and awkward and just insignificant that I can't help but feel like this was not meant to be the case. I I felt like they had something better in mind. Maybe they rushed something. Maybe it was just a fail, doomed from the start, but this is just poor execution to say the least. Yep, 
Yep, I'll agree. <laughs> okay, um, uh, the best track on this album is AS Enter. The worst track is the rest of it, but if I had to pick one that really just didn't do anything for me was AS Labyrinth. And I gave this album a decent three. So I'm, being, <laughs> I'm being liberal here. Uh, my favorite tracks were Too Late, uh, Going, which I actually think was a brilliant track, and Aka. My least favorite tracks were Flat and Trouble, and I gave this album a light four. All right. All right. Next album, we have Portrait of an Ugly Man by Remo Drive. Is that how you say it? Uh, Remo. Remo Drive. And this is the fourth studio album from Remo Drive, and... It's just one of the biggest whatevers I've had to listen to this year. Like, and um, I remember you you were like talking about how you know how they made an amazing debut, which I'm going to get to. And you were showing me a bunch of tracks, and the track you showed me, I was just baffled. This was this does not <laughs> seem like the same band. It like, just isn't. Literally, like instrumentally and vocally, this is painfully bland, painfully generic, like. If you didn't, if you didn't give any context into uh, into Remo Drive, this you'd probably think this is just some random in indie rock bandcamp. Like I couldn't care less about any of these tracks on here. Not a single one stood out to me because they just all blended together and were just painfully blind and painfully generic. And also, the cover art is just like fucking Hobo Johnson worship. <laughs> it's like a mix between the rise and fall of Hobo Johnson, and. That that's all I really have to say about it. Um, yeah, this is not the Remo Drive I know and love. Uh, ever since I think the drummer Sam left the band, the band just has been on a downward spiral into this indie, generic indie rock mess. I feel like they're they're trying to. Well, I I don't feel like I know they're trying to expand and upgrade their sound, but in turn they they strip away all the raw energy. That made them such an amazing band back in 2017 with greatest hits. And, you know, coming into this, it's just, it's not the same band. It's, it's just, uh, increasingly, they're just releasing increasingly lifeless, uh, indie rock. It's far from the worst thing I've, I've, it's far from even the worst indie rock album I've heard this year, but it's also not really significant in any way. It doesn't do anything to stand out. To, to make itself feel interesting and unique. And, you know, it's just... It's sad to see that the band has... Releasing this poor quality music, you know... Twice in a row now. Their last album was a, a flop as well. Only three years after coming onto the scene and... Releasing Greatest Hits, which... I thought was, you know, the start of a fucking amazing career. Um, you know... It's kind of ironic that their first album is titled Greatest Hits because at this point it it really is like a greatest hits compilation <laughs> when it comes to their discography. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just not that interesting. It's 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 far from awful, but it's just not interesting. True, true. Uh, I gave this album a light four, and my favorite tracks were True and Romance Lives, and the worst track is rest of, and the rest of the album. Like, I don't care for anything else. I don't remember anything else from <laughs> this album. Uh, my favorite track were A Guide to Love By, Dead Man, and A Flower and a Weed. My least favorite tracks were If You've Ever Looked Too Deep in Thought, and... No, If I've Ever Looked Too Deep in Thought, and The Ugly Man Sings, and I gave it a decent four. Alright. Next, we have Women in Music Part 3 by Hyam. This is the third studio album from the California Sister Trio. And uh, while it's not the most uh, original thing in the world, I honestly do enjoy the material that's brought on here. The trio delivers some fun, well-produced and pretty vibey material. I like a bulk of the production and the guitar work, and the drums especially. Some of the synth pieces appear too, and I think they're pretty solid. I could ask a little bit more from the songwriting, and a couple of tracks are duds, but all in all, I like this album. Um, yeah, I've never been really too fond of Haim's very breezy and summery aesthetic. Uh, yet, this album, I, I feel like a lot of people seem to be foaming at the mouth over it. And I'm just not really enjoying it that much. Uh, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Maybe maybe it'll click with me at some point. But I've, I've listened to it three times now. And 
you know, I, I, I gave it my full attention and just is a bit underwhelming to me. The production is fine. The songwriting is never really anything to write home about. And instrumentally, it seems very thin and just safe. And it just feels like an, another indie pop album, which a few years down the road, I probably won't remember at all. You know, I'm happy for everyone who enjoys this, but it's just not really for me. I've not really been able to get into it. And that's fair. I love how when mm. um when you were posting about it on Album of the Year, and <laughs> the amount of comments you got back was yeah. hilarious. Was, someone <laughs> just commented yesterday and called me a retard. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, was, it might have been a troll account, though. But it, it was, was pretty funny. <laughs> it was definitely a troll account. I think yeah, I got one I, of those when I reviewed I, Exeter. Oh, well, I went onto the page and someone was like, can you please stop calling people retards? It's not funny. Well, that's good, at least. At least someone has your back. <laughs> Hell, and I even have your back. Um, All right. Yeah. All right, my favorite tracks from uh, Women in Music Part 3 are All That Ever Mattered, 3 AM in Los Angeles. My least favorite tracks are Another Try and Men from the Magazine, and I gave this album a strong 7. My favorite tracks were 3 AM, Don't Want It, and The Steps. My least favorite tracks were Gasoline and Another Try, and I gave it a strong four. All right. Next, we have uh, Kick Eye by Arca. I hope uh, I'm saying that album title right. Ah, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, this is the fourth studio album from Venezuelan producer and DJ Alejandra Gersi under the Arca name. And uh, with this album, it's pretty experimental. It's fusing elements of electronic music, glitch pop, bubblegum bass and even latin pop at one point mm. and the feature list for this was actually pretty impressive too we got features from the likes of rosalia sophie and even bjork is on this album and uh, of all those i think bjork had my favorite feature on the album yeah i can agree yeah and um with this album though i feel like i wasn't really into it all that much personally i like the aesthetic but i feel like the execution was a bit poor like, there are a lot of tracks that I don't really care for, and a lot of the time they just have a bit too much going on that make them feel kind of disjointed and a bit all over the place. Like, it feels like these were kind of all, like, ideas that were just meshed together with um, with no point of when to stop. But all in all, it's fine. It's decent. But it's just the disjointedness and the all-over-the-place nature of this album that um, kind of draws me away from it. So, yeah, that's all I really have to say about it. Um, yeah, I've never really been fond of um, Arca's production style. Um, it always just felt kind of empty and void of substance to me. Like, her her work with Bjork on Utopia was fine for the most part. I, I did enjoy the production on that, but as a whole, it just never really did much for me. But on this new Arca project, I think it's, it's certainly not groundbreaking, but I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, her production style is just is largely still you know very much what you would expect from Arca, but it feels more full, more bulky, and more interesting and ear catching than than ever before on her previous self titled album, for example, which I know a lot of people enjoyed, but I never really got into. And as a whole, it, it's not the best album. I think there it still has its fair share of flaws, but I think it's it's a it. Well, maybe not in a, a step in the right direction because I know a lot of people do like Arca's music, but a step in a direction which I can certainly enjoy a lot more. In my, in my, a when step it comes to in my a direction personal. that you can respect. Yeah, a step. No, no, I, I respect Arca's well, work. It's just yeah, obviously. It's a step in a, a direction that nostalgia can enjoy. <laughs> that it might uh, please <laughs> yeah. nostalgia in full. Yeah, I I, I may once be pleased. <laughs> Okay, um, my favorite tracks from Kick Eye are Afterwards, Calor, and Machote. My least favorite track was uh, Rip the Slit, and I gave this album a light six. Uh, uh, my favorite tracks were Ricky Ricky, Mecha Trefe, uh, Afterwards, KLK, and my least favorite track was Non Binary. I gave this album a strong five. Okay, next we have What's Your Pleasure by Jesse Ware. <coughs> This is Jessie Ware's fourth studio album, and this album sees her blend elements of dance pop, house, and disco in a pretty nostalgic way, pretty similar to uh, what Dua Lipa did earlier on this year. And um, I feel like uh, Jessie did this fantastically. I think this is a fantastic record, probably one of the 
Probably one of the best uh, pop records of the year, in my opinion. The production throughout this album is absolutely fantastic. It's it's very ear grabbing. It's very fun, carefree. It's pretty uh, it's pretty nostalgic, obviously. And obviously, like I said, it blends the, those uh, elements of different genres, and I think it works wonders. It's just really it's really great. And um, Jessie herself is a fantastic vocalist. She really brings life to these instrumentals. You know, a lot of the lyrical themes are pretty sensual. And I think she does well. She adds a lot of personality to these instrumentals. And this is probably everything that I could ask for in this kind of a record. And yeah, not a single dull moment on this album for me. Honestly, I really, really liked it. And hmm. yeah, that's all I really have to say. Uh, yeah, this is the first Jesse Ware project I've I've ever heard. And I'm, I'm very impressed. It's one of the most in- engaging pop albums I've heard in a long time. Uh, largely due to the very very good production uh, it takes heavily from you know the worlds of house and new disco music and combines them with contemporary values to to create a final project that is both very intricate and exciting yet at the same time it's still very much pop oriented and familiar and comforting and you know not to mention her performances on on every track are brilliant um she you know performs with so much swagger and charisma and her voice match- matches the very lush and, you know, groovy instrumentation perfectly. And, you know, with this and with future nostalgia, I'm, I'm spoiled for choice for um, disco-infused pop albums this year. I, I'm, I'm loving it, and I'm, I'm, I really like this album. Alright, well, I'd definitely take this over future nostalgia anyway, but that's just my <laughs> opinion. I still um, prefer future nostalgia. Uh... <laughs> 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 Alright, uh, the best tracks from this album are Spotlight, Save a Kiss, In Your Eyes, Step Into My Life, and The Kill. My least favourite track was Adore You, and I gave this album a decent 8. Uh, my favourite tracks were Spotlight, Soul Control, Adore You, and The Kill. And my least favourite track was Ulala. Um, for now, I gave it a, a very strong 7. I might bump that up to an 8 eventually. Alright. Alright, next we have Mordecai by Krungbin. This is the fourth studio album from the Texas-based psychedelic rock outfit. And with this album, I think it's pretty solid, but I just don't find it overly consistent. They deliver a very solid, vibey psych rock album that has some really nice bass work and some pretty sweet guitar sounds that are pretty well crafted and well made. And it's not really anything original or mind-blowing. Most of this is just a vibe. It's, uh, it's It's pretty relaxing and pretty breezy. And it's almost like elevator music in a way, but honestly, mm-hmm. that's I I do enjoy the aesthetic of it. Uh, there's not really much else to say about it. It's actually a pretty. It's just a overly. It's just a nice uh, album to say the least. There's not much else to say about it. Um, yeah, I think this album does what it wants to do very well, which is kind of form more of a, a sonic, groovy instrumental backdrop rather than be a very you know immediate uh, and in your face you know release. And, you know, it, it succeeds in that. I think it's, 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 it's more laid back and exotic. Uh, it's a more laid back and exotic approach at Psychedelia. And it's certainly enjoyable. And it is, as you said, a, definitely a vibe. <laughs> it <laughs> just leaves me wanting a bit more, more often than not. Um, you can, you can tell the band is very talented, very aligned musically and, you know, complement each other well. It, it would just, be great to hear maybe something more immaculate and um you know grandiose than this which is it's it's very pleasant background music i don't think it's uh really engaging enough to warrant many listens or you know put it in the hierarchy of my favorite albums this year but what i did hear i i did enjoy yeah i can agree with you there hmm. okay um my favorite tracks from Mordecai are Time, Pelota, Dearest Alfred, Sheeta, and First Class. My least favorite track was Conisos de Foss, and I gave this uh, album a decent 7. Uh, my favorite tracks were If There's No Question, Father Bird, Mother Bird, One to Remember. My least favorite track was also Conisos de Foss, and I gave it a six, uh, light, a decent 6. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, moving on, we have Inlet by Hum. This is the fifth studio album from the Illinois alt-rock and shoegaze act Hum, 
and this is their first album in over 22 years. Welcome now, back home. Th- welcome back home. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and halfway through listening to this, I only realized that this was the same band that we were listening to the other night during a listening mm. party. And uh, honestly, I'm happy to hear this because I do enjoy this album a fair bit. I like how there's blends of, you know, shoegaze, the dreamy aesthetic, alt metal with some pretty deep and pretty uh, nice riffs, some post-hardcore, and as a result, they created a very solid body of work. I really like a lot of the riffs on this album. They're pretty they're pretty simple, yet they're really loud, pretty deep. The melodies are pretty dreamy, and I really like the drum work too. The drums are pretty punchy on this album. Um... Track lengths are pretty long on this one, some which range to about 8 minutes or to 9 minutes. And, you know, some tracks just don't really interest me as much or keep interesting for that amount of time that they take up. But there is plenty of good material on this album to compensate for that. And this this is definitely something that I could see myself revisiting or even bumping up to an 8 if I, um, if I ever go back to it. And yeah, that's all I really have to say. Yeah, I think home, this new Home album is is a very in-your-face approach to shoegaze with very like post-hardcore and, as you said, alt-metal-inspired instrumentation, you know, colliding headfirst with these floaty, ethereal shoegaze qualities and quite pleasant vocal performances, and the final product is pretty damn good. It, it feels... This whole album just feels very massive and crushing at times with its instrumentation and guitar effects. But at the same time, you know, the quite pleasant and sincere vocals keep it all grounded and make it just as comforting as it is. It's just unsettling. Uh, There are some parts, some tracks that I don't really care for as much. Um, But I do have a feeling that I will be revisiting this album throughout the year and I have a feeling this may grow on me. And yeah, just as you said, I may I may bump the score up. You'll find out what the score is in a, in a, in a second. But I, I it may be going up in the future. My bad for uh, spoiling a bit of my score there, but my favorite. Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> we were supposed to have. Well, I'll, I'll spoil it too. I'll make it even. I I also give it a strong seven, and I I may also bump it up to an eight. All right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, my favorite tracks were "Step Into You," "Desert Rambler," "Folding," and "I'm the Den." My least favorite track was Cloud City, and like uh, like I mentioned, it's a uh, strong seven. My favorite tracks were Waves, Cloud City, and Shapeshifter, and my least favorite track was In the Den. Very strong seven. All right, we're on to the final album for today's Ooh. recap. We have a good one to finish of the... off with. Ooh. We have uh, <laughs> Weight of the World by Mike. This is the eighth studio album from the New Jersey not rapper Killer Mike. Mike. Obviously not. Uh, Killer Mike's <laughs> from Atlanta anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, not the um, Mike who kills. <laughs> not the Killer Milk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay, well, like I said, this is the eighth studio album from New Jersey MC, Mike. I heard about Mike through his last album, Tears of Joy, which I didn't get a chance to check out, but I probably will after this. But with this album, it's been rated very highly on Rate Your Music. Didn't you say it was like the second highest rated album on Rate Your Music for this year? <laughs> currently but i think the jesse Ware is gonna blow everything out of the water when it gets put in the charts because it's it's got like almost a thousand votes and well over a four out of ten yeah that that may be the new number one but right now this is number two on the charts behind only vegetable cutters i thought you said vegetable cutters there for a minute vegetable cutters (laughs) yes (laughs) Well, um, with Weight of the World, this is a very uh, lyrically dense and abstract hip hop album. Lyrically, this album is a very is a very personal take on Mike's well being as a black man in America dealing with depression and just the whole weight of the world on his shoulders. And I really do enjoy Mike. I think he is a very charismatic uh, character for rap. I think he's his flow is pretty unique. It's pretty choppy and pretty clumsy, but I feel like that's like a charm that I can see in Mike as an MC. And um, and the production on this album, it's very, it's lo-fi. It's at times psychedelic. It's very abstract, much like from what you would hear on uh, on a lot of the earlier stuff that we got this year, like from of maybe Armand uh, Hammer, you know, mm. K- Quelle Chris and Chris Key's album that came out this yeah. year, and even there's a kind of similarity to some rap songs. And that's Mm -hmm. what I like about it. I like that aesthetic, and I love that album. And I think that Mike pulled this off very well. He flows very well over these instrumentals. 
I'm liking a lot of what he's doing. And overall, it's just a pretty unique album that has come out this year in the hip-hop scene. And, you know, the underground keep bringing us some good projects. And Mike is definitely someone to look out for in the hip-hop scene. And honestly, I'm loving what he's mm. doing on here. So, yeah, that's all I really have to say. <clears throat> Way of the World by Mike. Yeah, if, if not for that Run the Jewels uh, album, this would probably be my favorite hip-hop. This would definitely be my favorite hip-hop release of the year so far. This one is top five for me. I'm seriously impressed by this. I, I love how... You know, Mike's, as you said, his flows are very charming and uh, they have to just have this very warm, like, kind of and charismatic quality to them. And it's it's really a blast to listen to. And he he incorporates his flows effortlessly into these very unsettling and, and very vaporwave inspired instrumentals, especially when it comes to a lot of the sampling. Uh, it almost feels like this album just takes place in this some sort of like some sort of dystopian universe and you know it's it's a combination that could have just as easily completely flopped but you know it it never feels messy it just it feels so natural he it feels very strange in the best way possible and you know it's just such an odd approach instrumentally and you know such a brilliant execution when it comes to his verses that it's just one of the most memorable albums I've heard this year, and you know, I it's it's going to be up there on my end of year charts. I have a feeling. Um, I have a feeling it'll def- end up on mine as well. Yeah, I'm definitely going to keep Mike on my my radar from now on. I've definitely been sleeping on them. I admit that. Uh, I admit that first, as well. Yeah, this is the first Mike album I've actually heard. Uh, certainly won't be the last. All right. My favorite tracks from Weight of the World are All Star, Weight of the World, Weight of the World, Word, I mean, and No No. Uh, my least favorite track was uh, Love Supremacy, and I gave this album an 8. My favorite tracks were Weight of the World, All Star, No No, Love Supremacy. My least favorite track was Is You Stupid. I gave this track a light 8. Nice, nice. Uh huh. All right, next we're just going to give you our top five albums and our top and our bottom three albums that we've covered in uh, today's oh, episode. Bottom three. Yeah, remember we did a bottom three last time. Is it? Hello, Mick. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So- sorry for the technical issue, guys. Sorry we back. For the technical issue. We and we back. Is All it right. is it three worst? Oh, three correct? worst, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, same as what we did last week: five mm. to four to three to two to one. Okay. Uh, my fifth favorite album that came. Actually, will we start with the best or worst? We'll start with the worst. Get those out of the way. Okay, um, the third worst album from this episode is A Portrait of the of an Ugly Man, Re- Rem- Remo Drive. Uh, my third worst is Amnesia Scanner, Tearless. My second worst is uh, Tearless by Amnesia Scanner. My second worst is Tiana Taylor, the album. And my first, the <laughs> worst album we've covered in today's episode is uh, The Black Eyed Peas with Translation. Uh, yeah, Black Eyed Peas translation as well for me. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> Not a fucking surprise. Um, Alright, my fifth favourite album from today's episode is Sideways to New Italy. Oh, uh, my fifth is Hum In. <laughs> I was waiting for your fourth, I'm slow. <laughs> Alright, my fourth is uh, Wage of the World by Mike. My fourth is Jesse Ware, What's Your Pleasure? My third is uh, What's Your Pleasure, Jesse Ware. Well, my third is Mike, Weight of the World. Hey! <laughs> my second favourite is uh, Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers. My second favourite is also Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers. Sorry, and my Phoebe, fi- but, you know. But RTJ there's two men out the there jewels. who just Yeah, there's two men out there who just blew it out of the water. My my favorite album of June is Run the Jewels RTJ4. Can we just have a clap for Killer Mike and LP? Absolutely. 
Okay, so that is it for today's episode of the Taped Podcast. We hope that you enjoyed. Like we mentioned in the previous episode, look out for our Animal Collective Worst to Best next week. And the week Ooh. after, expect our Aphex Twin Worst to Best as well. And like I mentioned, we have a uh, two months full with uh, I yeah, with, uh, with episodes that. coming. We'll we'll keep doing these at the end of every month, but in between we've got some some most yeah just only worst to best, but some some cool artists in there, some artists that me and Mick may not be as familiar with that we will you know. And you there's know, also some that we the there's sorry yeah, sorry go ahead. There's also there's also there's some, some. We're, we're big fans of, but we're gonna delve into some new discographies. We're gonna rank them, and we're gonna have plenty of guests. We will let you know in the coming weeks. And Mm -hmm. thank you guys so much for checking out today's episode of the Taped Podcast. Links in the description will be to our Rate Your Music and Album of the Years and our Patreon as well. And as always, see ya. Bye.